so you want to get into the X-Men. Marvel's Merry Mutants. Do you really think you're mutant enough to tackle this nearly six year old franchise? Welcome to X-Men Boot Camp. By the time I'm done with you, you're gonna be living, breathing, and eating X-Men. Not like that. You know what I mean. Unless... Hey y'all, it's Eric. Welcome back to another video. Weird intro? What weird intro? I don't know what you're talking about. And as you can tell from the title, I'm about to tell you everything you need to know about getting into Marvel's X-Men. Before I get into the meat of it, um, I just want to say thank you for the mostly positive response to my WandaVision video. I'm really glad to be able to have educated people on this topic. Please continue to um, share it with other people, with anybody who's confused about the situation. Yeah, thank you so, so much. I can't really um, articulate how happy I am that people are actually watching it and actually taking something from it. If you haven't seen that video, definitely go and watch it. So, Maybe you've heard of the X-Men, heard of the mutant metaphor and find it interesting and relatable. Maybe you're a movies fan, but comics intimidate you. Maybe you're just hot for Nightcrawler, but you have no idea where to start. No worries, I'm here to help. Most people have a vague idea of who the X-Men are. A superhero team that protects the world even though the world fears and hates them. They live in a school for their kind, they're objectively the best superhero team, you know, the basics. But just in case you're coming into this knowing nothing, let's get a short paraphrase definition from Wikipedia. The X-Men are a team of fictional mutant superheroes appearing in American comic books published by Marvel Comics. Most of the X-Men are mutants, a subspecies of humans who are born with superhuman abilities activated by the X-Gene. The X-Men fight for peace and equality between normal humans and mutants in a world where anti-mutant bigotry is fierce and widespread. They're led by Charles Xavier, known as Professor X, a powerful mutant telepath who can control and read minds. Their archenemy is Magneto, a powerful mutant with the ability to manipulate and control magnetic fields who leads the Brotherhood of Mutants. Professor X works towards peace and understanding between mutants and humans, while Magneto views humans as a threat and believes in taking an aggressive approach against them, though he has found himself working alongside the X-Men from time to time. So essentially, X-Men is about mutants, this sort of fantastical, oppressed class. A lot of mutant experiences near the experiences and histories of people of color, LGBTQ people, disabled people, and so on. So the X-Men proper are a team of people who are looking out for mutants while also trying to maintain peace between the oppressed and the oppressors. And coming from that are radical factions that beliefs can span from dismantling structures of oppression, isolating from humans, mutant supremacy, and so on. As these stories progress, the core values of the X-Men evolve and change. There is a lot of conversation in these stories about whether pacifism really serves the oppressed, whether respectability really serves the oppressed, and so on. Besides those consistent underlying themes, X-Men is full of so much found family drama, time travel, weird science, alternate universes, burning bright platonic and romantic love, colorful costumes, queer coding, and some queer canon. It's so rich in socio-politically relevant stories. There's just so much X-Men has been, can be, and is. Now, there's a lot of X-Men content out there. Again, it is nearly 60 years old. It can be very, very overwhelming, so I'm gonna break them all down into sort of more digestible pieces. Of X-Men content can be organized into a couple categories. Movies, cartoons, TV shows, and comics and I'll briefly mention the games. I'm going to list all these things in a particular order, but you don't have to go by that order. If you're more of a cartoons person, start there. If you're more of a comics person, start there. 
or you can do multiple at a time. It all depends on what medium connects with you personally. So first, movies. Even though, as I said, you can start wherever it works best for you, but I would recommend starting with the movies first. Most people find movies more digestible than other mediums. On top of that, the X-Men Cinematic Universe, the XMCU, does a good job of communicating some of the core X-Men concepts as well as versions of some of the iconic X-Men stories. You can separate X-Men movies into two categories, the movies that came out in the 2000s and the movies that came out in the 2010s. The 2010s movies are prequels to the 2000s movies in a sense. There's some time travel retcon mess going on, but we'll jump that hurdle when we get to it. Just in general, prefer for a lot of time travel, dimension hopping nonsense when it comes to X-Men. By the way, retcon means when something is established in canon, and then later in canon it's established that actually that thing didn't happen, or didn't happen in the way that we think it happened. Or that it simply doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> the 2000s movies are X-Men, X-Men 2, X-Men The Last Stand, Wolverine Origins, and The Wolverine. The 2010s movies are X-Men First Class, X-Men Days of Future Past, X-Men Apocalypse, Dark Phoenix, Deadpool, Deadpool 2, and Logan. The 2000s X-Men movies are more conceptual in my opinion. They communicate the core ideas of the X-Men mythos and introduce you to the usual main players in X-Men media. Cyclops, Storm, Wolverine, Jean Grey, Charles Xavier, etc. They're less character focused except when it comes to Wolverine. He's basically the main character of those movies. The 2010s movies are much more character focused in comparison, particularly with regards to Professor X and Magneto. They're also invested in historical world building that's specific to those movies, but is universally interesting when it comes to exploring fantasy oppression as like a concept. For instance, it connects the X-Men to historical events like the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Vietnam War. If you're a character-driven kind of watcher or your exposure to X-Men is through the Charles Eric X-Men ship, I would start with X-Men First Class. If you're more interested in X-Men lore or your exposure to X-Men is through the cartoons or comics, I would recommend the 2000s movies. My personal watch list recommendation? Watch X in First Class, then watch the 2000s films, and then watch the rest of the 2010 films. Wolverine movies optional except for Logan, that's mandatory. Deadpool movies optional because I low key don't care for Deadpool. However, if you're a chronological type person, and um, let's use that term loosely with these movies, a somewhat chronological. A uh, watch list for these movies would be and mind the plot holes and inconsistencies. X Men First Class, Wolverine Origins, X Men, X Men 2, X Men The Last Stand, The Wolverine, X Men Days of Future Past, X Men Apocalypse, Dark Phoenix, Deadpool, Deadpool 2, and Logan. The idea of anyone watching Wolverine Origins that early in their X Men movies journey pains me, but yeah. Also, I left me mutants out of this entire discussion because. <laughs> bro, please, bro! Why are you doing- oh, Listen, we'll talk about that in another video. But it takes place between Deadpool 2 and Logan, so there's that. And there was a bad TV movie called Generation X that came out in the 90s. I made a video about it um, a bit ago, and uh, yeah, it's a lot. Next, cartoons. A ton of people's first exposure to X-Men is cartoons, which I'm so grateful for because they're, mainly, extremely good. So let me shed some light on what they are and what might be best for you. The first X-Men cartoon is X-Men the Animated Series. I call it x -Men Tass. It's based on the 90s comics and the previous catalog of comics. It's from the 90s, so it's got the particular 90s cheese, but it's the best kind of cheesy. You look nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. It's so endearing and it's a lot of fun. X-Men Test has some of the most solid adaptations of iconic X-Men stories to date. It really benefits from being an episodic medium. Two-hour live-action movies simply aren't enough to recreate these grand, sprawling comic stories, which is a big part of why movie adaptations aren't so much adaptations as they are retellings. 
Exum test was really helpful to me early in my interest in Exum because it was a more digestible way of familiarizing myself with so many different X-Men storylines and characters. It's a groundbreaking show that pioneered several cartoon techniques with relation to serialized storytelling and communicating mature themes to children. It's also a huge part of why we even have the X-Men movies to begin with. Its success is what made Fox purchase film rights from Marvel. There are 5 seasons, 76 episodes, so there's a lot to watch. If you're interested in particular characters, the lineup is Wolverine, Cyclops, Jean, Gambit, Rogue, Beast, Jubilee, and of course Magneto and Professor X. Next is X-Men Evolution. And X-Men Evolution, I literally can't believe it exists y'all because it is literally just a high school AU. It's the X-Men, but they're teens that go to high school so they're also superheroes in the secret. It was made in 2000, so big Y2K cartoon vibes. It's less invested in adapting storylines and creates several of its own. However, they're all very compelling and in some ways still align with the comics. I know a lot of people my age or older watched that show as kids. and also sparked a lot of people's early love of Nightcrawler. So many people have told me about their crushes on XME Kurt. It's insane. There's four seasons and 52 episodes, so there's a lot to see there too. There are a lot of characters in X-Men Evolution that somehow all get their time to shine, but the X-Men lineup in this show is Cyclops, Jean Grey, Rogue, Nightcrawler, Kitty Pride, and Spike, a character made for the show. Also Storm, Charles Xavier, and Wolverine, but those three are adults. And this is one of the few properties where the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants actually gets to shine, and actually includes Wanda and Petro. Lastly, there's Wolverine and the X-Men, and I don't have a lot to say about this, unfortunately. I tried to watch it. I found the art and animation style to be very uninspired and kind of ugly. And I found the plot pretty boring. And it's funny that I don't like it because it's one of the few pieces of X-Men content that has all of the Magnus family consciously together. And if you know me, you know I love the Magnus family. But let's go back to Wikipedia for a summary. The story begins with Wolverine and Rogue having an argument about Wolverine leaving. When Wolverine goes to Charles and Jean, they get headaches. An explosion occurs and Charles and Jean disappear. The resulting trauma causes the X-Men team to disband and go their separate ways, leaving Xavier's once highly revered League of Mutant Peace Preservers out of commission. Due to the loss of the Professor, Jean, and severe damage to the mansion, many of the X-Men have withered in their faith towards the stability of their former team as since detached themselves from their former community. And so from there, it's about Wolverine bringing them together to fight a increase in anti-mutant violence and them healing from their trauma from what happened. And it sounds compelling on paper, but I don't know. Main players are Wolverine, Cyclops, Emma Frost, Beast, Storm, Nightcrawler, Kitty, damn this team big as hell, Iceman, Angel, and Forge. I definitely don't mean to deter anybody from watching it, but like don't be fooled that because it's the newest one that it must be better than the others. Special mentions go to Pride of the X-Men, the 1989 TV pilot. It's a trip and a half. I recommend watching it like for fun. I actually really enjoyed the art style and the 90s sort of anime inspired aesthetics. Speaking of anime, there's also the X-Men anime, which is, um... Yeah, giving very much original English language manga, very much Tokyo pop, very much Toonami. I will not be watching but you can if that's something you want to do. Speaking of X-Men anime, go look up the Japanese openings for XM tasks. I use them for my end screens and shit. Why didn't we get that X-Men anime? <laughs> Moving on, TV shows. Yes, yes, there are X-Men TV shows. Only two. We take what we can get. First of all, The Gifted. I adore The Gifted, and no, that's not just because I stand one or day in every single day of my life. The Gifted provides this look into mutant life and mutant oppression that hadn't been explored in the X-Men cinematic universe before. Outside of the superhero, outside of the X-Mansion. The lives of mutants on the ground, regular people struggling to survive, and the underground movements trying to help them. 
Sometimes in the X-Men stories, the plights of the average mutant can be homogenized and seen as a concept rather than a huge group of individual people with distinct lived experiences, and The Gifted completely pushes against that. It's not necessarily breaking ground artistically, but narratively it was doing some super interesting things. It also contains some of the first on-screen representations of some popular but not overexposed characters, particularly my girl Lorna aka Polaris. Characters to highlight here are Polaris, Thunderbird, Blink, and the Stepford Cuckoos. There's two seasons and 29 episodes. And the second show is Legion. Legion is focused around Charles Xavier's son, David Holler. David has schizophrenia and is also a mutant with telepathy, telekinesis, reality warping powers, a whole bunch of other shit. The show is basically about him trying to understand himself and his past while being hunted for nefarious causes. This show is cinematically gorgeous. It's very trippy, very steeped in psychedelia, 60s, 70s aesthetics, over reality, it's got it all. It's very art house in some ways. Simply put, whatever WandaVision and Doctor Strange have going on, Legion did it first, better, and much more authentically. This is a show I'd recommend to people who don't know anything about Marvel to people who hate Marvel simply because it's artistic merit. I will warn that it gets weird. There are some themes of sexual assault, some explicit violence, derealization, and some not quite questioned ableist ideas mixed in. Definitely look it up for triggers. Um, DoesTheDogDie.com is really great for that. Also, in talking about these live action shows and movies, I want to note that they have a really big problem with whitewashing. Magneto, Polaris, Quicksilver, and David Holler are all Jewish and they are all played by non-Jewish actors. Ridiculous. There's also issues with colorism, like Storm continually being played by light-skinned biracial black actors despite not being light-skinned or biracial black. Intermission for games. Sorry you only get a minuscule part because there's a bajillion of you and only some of you are good. X-Men Legends 1 and 2 are fire. It's an RPG kind of dungeon crawler from the 2000s. You can play as so many different characters, like not just the same couple ones they throw in every Marvel game. For example, some often left out characters you can play as are Iceman, Jubilee, Psylocke, Gambit, and Emma Frost in the first one, and Scarlet Witch, Magneto, and Nightcrawler in the second. It's a ton of fun. They're on PC, GameCube, PS2, Xbox. It's old as fuck, you can definitely emulate it. X-Men Children of the Atom and X-Men vs. Capcom are fucking classic arcade fighting games. You can play them both at PlayRetroGames.com. If you really want to check out the old, old X-Men games from the late 80s and 90s, most of them are also on PlayRetroGames.com. You are helpless against my power! You are dead! <laughs> I'm not saying they're bad, I enjoy them as a huge X-Men fan who is definitely interested in archaic bad media. They're just not great for beginners, and some of them aren't particularly fun. But I might also be like prejudiced because they're like really old games and gaming was a lot different then than it is like even 20 years ago. And now, for the comics. Yes, I know, I know. The scariest part. The most daunting part. It's literally decades of a bajillion different comics that all intersect and where do you even start? How do you even start? But it's okay, I'm here. Your comics Uncle Eric. Before we get into the nitty gritty, let's go over some key terminology. This is a single issue, sometimes called a floppy because, you know, floppy. They usually come out monthly. It's like a chapter of a book. And that book, the title that comes for the issue one, issue two, is what we call a series or a run. A trade paperback is a collection of issues. It's often just multiple issues of a specific series, but it can also be specialized to a specific character and include multiple different issues from multiple different series. For instance, this trade paperback collects the entirety of Magneto Testament, while Avengers Scarlet Witch collects Scarlet Witch focused comics from Scarlet Witch to Marvel Comics Presents, Mystic Arcana, and more. It can also collect issues of a specific story, for instance they are trade paperbacks for the Dark Phoenix Saga, Inferno, etc. Omnibus is like a mega trade paperback. It collects a lot of issues, often an entire series if feasible. 
These are usually only available in physical form, but the other ones that I mentioned are available in both digital and physical form. Now, let's get into it. First of all, you don't have to read all the comics. No one's expecting that of you. Basically, nobody has. We have lives and jobs and responsibilities, and nobody has time for that. You're under no obligation to know everything or have read everything, and if somebody says that, fuck them. They're probably some boring as fuck comics bro who doesn't wash their ass anyway. So, how to get comics. I recommend going digital simply because it's cheaper and easier. Especially in this panoramic. There are multiple ways to access comics digitally. I personally recommend Comixology Unlimited. So funny that just as I start to continue editing this video that, let me remind you, I filmed in summer of 2021. One single thing suddenly ages so badly that I need to do an interjection. Uh, but anyway, Comixology, which is owned by Amazon, sort of shit the bed recently and it's moved to consolidate its service with Amazon Kindle, so it's sort of a mess right now from its search functions to its reading app. This just happened like yesterday as I'm recording, so I don't know if they'll be re reworking the site. So I'm not going to say not to use it, but just keep in mind that it may be more difficult to use a service than I'm about to say here. I will link some articles in the description going over the site and app issues if you're interested. Uh, it kind of throws a wrench in making this uh, simple to do, as in like reading comics. But I just currently more highly recommend the other alternatives I'm about to mention. It's a subscription service that will give you access to a ton of older comics and the first couple of issues of some newer comics at no extra cost. It can also give you discounts on comics you need to buy to access. You can get a free trial and then it's $5.99 a month. I also recommend Hoopla, a free online library that you only need a public library card to access. They have a ton of digital trade paperbacks of collected X-Men comics there. That said, Comixology is available worldwide. Comixology Unlimited, the subscription service, is only available in the United States. Hoopla is only in the United States and Canada. If I am correct, Marvel Unlimited is a good alternative as it's international. You don't have to buy anything after subscribing, but they don't add new comics until three months after their initial release, which I don't understand. Like, do you not want to make money? The comics industry is a mess. Physical copies are available through book retailers and your local library. If you go physical, I would highly recommend seeking out trade paperbacks or omnibuses. However, if you're buying physical and keeping up with an ongoing comic, you're going to have to buy um, floppies. Now, I know there is a lot of discussion around piracy and fan communities, especially read the fact that a lot of the um, services that I mentioned either don't exist or are extremely inaccessible in the global south. I'm not going to get too deep into that um, ethical discussion in this video, um, besides emphasizing that you shouldn't fucking pirate indie and creator-owned comics as you're literally taking food out of creators' mouths. But I do want to explain and stress the importance of monetarily supporting current ongoing comics. Comics is one of the worst paid categories of the art industry and Marvel creators work almost exclusively work for hire. That means, and this is an oversimplification, but this means that the things that they create um, for Marvel, they have no rights to. They belong to Marvel. This means it's freelance, no royalties, uh, no ownership of stories or characters, no job security, no benefits. A few creators have received compensation for the work that has been adopted into movies, but this is a very case-by-case -case occurrence that is offered at Marvel's discretion. And in those instances, the amount paid to these creators is pennies compared to what Marvel has made off of their ideas. For instance, Ed Brubaker, the writer who created the unfrozen super soldier Bucky Barnes storyline, was paid a flat 5k for his work. For comparison, Captain America the Winter Soldier brought in over $700 billion worldwide. $5,000 versus $700 billion. And that's just one of the movies Bucky was in. People have this strange misconception that there's some kind of major trickle down from the billions as these makes to the comic creators. Um, no such luck. So recurrent comics 
sales are what defines whether a comic series continues or not, whether or not the series gets cancelled. And if a comic series a creator is working on gets cancelled, that's income gone, that's less work in that creator's portfolio which they use to get more jobs. So it's very important that we buy current comics whenever possible. And it's very frustrating that these kinds of methods of supporting creators are kind of left to the consumers when Marvel clearly has the money to be paying these creators more and giving them security. And just the fact that the business of comics is extremely, is extremely archaic and broken in the modern age and they're kind of losing money, especially in not counting digital sales as largely as they count physical sales. Like we live in 2021, we live in the future. In the grand scheme of things outside of working within the current system um, that is set up for comic creators and consumers, it is not actually uh, people not buying comics that is the root issue here. Um, the root issue begins and ends with the exploitation coming from these companies and their wild mismanagement. In that same vein, this work for hire setup means that nobody, no creators are really making money uh, from sales of old comics from say the 60s to 2000s. These series are already over, so I don't really worry about that. So moving to the comics themselves. I know this goes against most reading conventions, but you don't have to start at the beginning. I would recommend you not start at the beginning. Silver Age comics are what we call comics published from 1956 to 1970. The first X-Men comics published in 1963 fall under that. Professor X's original five X-Men, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Iceman, Beast, and Angel. Um, they're interesting. Don't get me wrong, do read them if you like, but they have some of the typical Silver Age trappings. Tonally ridiculous, shallow characterization, huge blocks of wordy text, sexism, racism, not that those things aren't in modern comics, etc. It's definitely not beginner friendly, and a lot of that early exposition isn't a lot that can't be gleaned from a cursory Marvel wiki skim. If you're new to comics and you're interested in the original X-Men, a good shouting point is X-Men Season 1, um, 2011. It's a one-shot that's kind of a modernized recap of the original five X-Men's um, adventures. <sighs> I find it a little bit strange, but it still is a good starting point. I don't know, Bobby has Justin Bieber hair and I don't know, it's just kind of a lot to see them kind of like giving like 2010s. There are a couple good ways to jump into X-Men comics. Popular beginning points, iconic stories, and character focused reading. Marvel Comics doesn't really work in a linear fashion. There's not just one big comic called X-Men. I mean there is, but that's just one piece of the puzzle. For example, a comic will begin with X-Men, get cancelled, be relaunched in five years as a new comic series called Uncanny X-Men, and then someone will create an offshoot comic series about a different but related story called X-Factor, and then there will be stories that intertwine between Uncanny X-Men and X-Factor, and then there will be like five different offshoot series at all times, and then decades later the Uncanny X-Men will just end after hundreds of issues. And then a few years later, someone will pick up the Uncanny X-Men name and make a new series that they'll call Uncanny X-Men Volume 2, and yeah, it's complicated. But again, remember you don't have to do any of this in order, there are no rules. There are some comic runs that are the center of each era of X-Men comics, and some offshoot series that are good beginning points. I'll be linking some of the great starting points I'm about to discuss in the description, because Google can be a nightmare when there are three comic series all with the same name and they all have a bunch of volumes. The original X-Men comic that began in 1964 took a five-year break in 1970 and was relaunched in 1975 as Uncanny X-Men. The relaunch began with the standalone story Giant Size X-Men, and the story continued with Uncanny X-Men number 94. This begins what is often referred to as a Claremont era as Chris Claremont wrote the majority of these new issues. This era spans from 1975 to 1991, from number 94 to number 279. 
It introduces many of the most iconic X-Men characters such as Storm, Nightcrawler, Colossus, Rogue, Kitty Pride, and Wolverine. X-Men, the comics, movies, all of that could not be what it is today without Claremont. I would say this is the number one place to start reading. Also, there's just a lot of focus on complex female characters, tons of queer subtext, homoeroticism, and random bouts of BDSM themes. Yeah, fun times. So if you're reading for the specific issue to read, look up Giant Size X-Men and then Uncanny X-Men Volume 1, number 94. Uncanny X-Men's trade paperbacks are called Uncanny X-Men Masterworks. You can also just read some iconic stories from this era that are often collected in trade paperbacks. Ones I recommend are God Loves, Man Kills, Days of Future Past, and The Dark Phoenix Saga. Aside on The Dark Phoenix Saga, most trade paperbacks only collect number 129 to 137, but in my opinion reading 101 to 108 first is crucial to truly understanding the saga. The trade paperbacks usually contain more of Jean's downfall more than her positive experiences with the Phoenix and her heroism as the Phoenix before the series of events that culminates in Dark Phoenix. Another good place is Uncanny X-Men's post-Claremont era beginning with number 280, which the X-Men cartoon draws a lot of inspiration from. It contains things like Cable and Deadpool's debut, Gambit's debut, X-Factor, and X-Force, and just general 90s bombast. There's also the X-Men 2000's relaunch that pretty much revitalized X-Men comics the new millennium. There is a ton of confusing name mess going on with that relaunch, but just search up new X-Men and make sure it's the one that began in 2001, not 2004. There's a particular focus on Xavier's as an actual school for mutants that hadn't really been focused on for a while, so if you're into that, definitely check it out. Do not start with House of X, no matter how ubiquitous it is online right now. That shit will be incomprehensible without some knowledge of the X-Men storied comics history. Not all of it, just some knowledge. House of X is very much a logical conclusion of everything the X-Men have gone through thus far. In terms of offshoot teams, New Mutants Volume 1 is amazing and I would recommend it if you love X-Men Evolution. It's essentially the first truly kid mutant superhero team and it's just so so good and so influential in how X-Men handles its teenage characters from there on out. It's very focused on character development, has some amazing storylines, amazing art, takes on a lot of dark themes, just chef's kiss. It's got some iconic characters like Magic, Danny Moonstar, Sunspot, they're all so so good. Another kid mutant team to check out is Generation X Volume 1. Yes, the team that was the subject of the awful TV movie. They're like New Mutants, but edgier, very 90s. You've got the spunky mall crawler, the brooding punk boy, the unfriendly black hottie, the hot rich principal, everything you want. Definitely check that out if you like X-Men Evolution as well. Now lastly, another way to read is character focused reading. So let's say your favorite character is Magneto and you want to see more of him specifically. So you would Google Magneto reading list. Reading lists are awesome. It's basically people rounding up and listing the best and slash or most important comic issues relevant to that character. That way you don't have to trudge through a bunch of comics hoping to see one character or so you can read up on a particular character's entire history pretty quickly. It can also expose you to particular runs or other characters you might be interested in. Part of why I started New Mutants was because I knew Magneto would eventually become the headmaster of Xavier's Zone. I also want to recommend the Cerebro podcast. It's a really fun podcast by Connor Goldsmith where each episode he and a guest talk about a particular character in their comics history. And in each episode, Connor does a segment where he summarizes a character's comics history in a really thorough but super digestible way. And remember, you can read comics non-linearly. When I was reading 70s and 80s comics, I jumped to Silver Age comics, and then I jumped to 2000s comics. There are no rules, and there's so much to explore. And that's all I got for you. That was a lot. So of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments or DM me on Twitter or something. And also like, let me know in the comments, was this helpful? Are there any of these pieces of media that you already know of or have like experiences with? What are you going to start with? If this did help you or you just like the video, be sure to like and subscribe. It really does help people find me. And I also just love to know that people like what I create. 
In the meantime, follow me on my other social media. On Twitter, I'm Bike Nesmith, where I post all the things I create and talk about a multitude of things, including X-Men. On Instagram, I post my illustration at Bike Nesmith and my style art at Lenchard. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you with a new video sometime.